In this video, I stay up all night remaking a panel, wrangle my first sliding doors, and power through an impossible finish process to make a cabinet I don't yet have the skills to make. This is not just another video about embracing mistakes. I started milling hard maple for this project in November 2022 nearly a full year after I took a $500 deposit to make it based on a design I came up with for it. Full disclosure, the client was my mom. She had this corner in her bedroom where all my family's photo albums have lived for almost 40 years. And her hope was to have a large custom cabinet to give my family's history a place of more honor than on the floor in a corner, as well as a bookshelf on top to curate her favorites from her library. The question you may be asking though, is why did it take me a year to start it? The question I was asking was, why did it take me three months to build it? The answer is complicated. At this point in my woodworking journey, I was still working full time as a software engineer, and my shop hours consisted of Monday nights and Saturday mornings. Time was scarce, and this project has 34 separate components, four of which are solid wood panels made up of at least seven to 10 planks, which each had to be milled and glued up separately. That might be some excuse for my delay and horribly slow pace, but it isn't the actual reason. The truth is, I was terrified to start building this piece. I had delayed starting it the year before because I didn't think I had all the right tools I needed to make it. So I researched and spent money on machines. I even bought a Festool Domino specifically because I felt I couldn't build this without it. I thought my tools and my shop were my limitation. But as you can see, I did finally start. What you've been watching me do so far is break down a bunch of eight quarter and four quarter hard maple into components and panel parts and put them through a typical milling process. Joint one edge and one face of each to get two square faces, plane to desired thickness and rip on the table saw. I did this initial milling process for all my parts now instead of as I needed them, not only to get it out of the way, but also so I could allow them to rest a while in my shop in case they move a bit after being milled. I can touch them up later when it's time to use them. It's easy to get lost in a build as complex as this. A typical table might have four legs, four aprons, and a top made of four to six boards. This has more than that. In fact, before I go on with the build, let's talk about the design a bit. The cabinet is 48 inches long, 20 inches deep, and 40 inches tall. We chose sliding doors due to space limitations in her room. There's a shelf inside and a bookcase with a couple of fixed shelves on top. Both hard maple tops will have a steep underbevel. Okay, now let's get back to the build. I felt like a good approach was to aim to get the basic frame of the cabinet standing up so these side panels seemed as good a place to start as any. I've learned nearly everything I know about woodworking from YouTube, including this trick to get perfect panel glue ups. Mark each edge of a panel with I and O, and then joint them one more time with that face either in toward the fence or out. This accounts for any error in the squareness of your fence. Thanks fellow woodworkers of YouTube. All right, now let's see how long it takes me to glue up one of these panels. The bottom of each side panel gets a slight curve. So I made a plywood template, rough cut each curve on the bandsaw, 
and template routed it. Simple enough. With this first step done, I'm actually feeling good about things. I've convinced myself that I was making too big of a deal of my fears and that if I just go slowly, I'll be fine. Maybe I was not in over my head at this point. My tools are serving me well and I haven't yet made the biggest mistake a woodworker can make, moving too quickly. The legs had to wait a bit once I got them square so I could make this tapering jig you see me using here. I've seen a lot of great tapering jigs based on sleds but this one is unique in that the workpiece rests directly on the table, allowing the use of the full height of the saw blade. And I needed that for this one because these legs are two and a half inches thick. I've put a link in the description where you can get plans I've made for this jig and be on the lookout for an upcoming video on how to make it. Still in pursuit of my first goal of getting the carcass to stand up on its own, I now turn to the horizontal stretcher pieces that tie the two sides together and facilitate the back panel, floor panel, and sliding doors. This cabinet will have double bypass sliding doors so they are able to slide both directions and not run into each other. So these top and bottom frame pieces will each have two grooves spaced just far enough apart that the finger pull inserts I'm going to add won't hit. Once those are cut, I can cut all the stretcher pieces to final length. Then I had no choice but to figure out where to cut domino mortises. This was confusing to say the least. I know the mortises all go in the same faces I just cut tapers on, but I'm planning to double up my tenons for additional strength and also want to allow some additional distance from the edge for about a quarter inch reveal. Also, the Vestal Domino needs me to set it up with millimeters. How many millimeters are in a quarter inch? So I stared at my plans, went through three or four marking systems, erased, drew new ones, and finally committed to drilling some holes. Well, this sucks. I do not know when this happened, but somehow I managed to cut this one like a full inch shorter than it should have been. This other one is fine, but this panel is basically just unusable. And it's a shame, but I can't use this. Uh, I'm gonna have to remake it. And this sucks because uh, it should have been a side of a cabinet and somehow I'm, I've made a mistake. Um, and I don't have a choice because I can't make it.
I had been looking forward to making the doors. Panels, schmanels. Some of this hard maple actually had some interesting figure in it. And since these are front facing, I took my time laying out the grain pattern. I ran my IO panel joining process again on these and glued them up. Where these doors get interesting is in convincing them to fit between the upper and lower stretchers. I had seen on YouTube how to do these, but of course, had never done it before. When in doubt, make a test piece. These need to fit snug, but not tightly since the doors need to slide in these grooves. The other factor to consider is how long to make the tenons and how deep to make the grooves. The top groove needs to be significantly deeper than the bottom groove. This is to allow the top tenon of the door panel to be pushed all the way into the top groove, swing the bottom of the door panel into place, and allow the bottom door tenon to settle into the bottom groove. Refining the length of the top tenon took some work because making it too long would result in an unnecessarily large shadow line and leaving it too short would not allow the door to fit in at all. Again, patience is woodworking's most important virtue. Rush and you'll screw operations like this up. Thankfully, no issues here. The only thing I did differently with the cabinet top panels is that I used dominoes for alignment and made it in two smaller panels. I find this to make for more manageable flattening when it's possible, because I can put these through my planer after the initial glue up, use dominoes again when gluing the two panels together, and minimize hand planning on the full panel. Especially when working with really hard material like hard maple, which is an absolute nightmare to hand plane. This next bit is gonna make some of you pull your hair out. Why didn't you just cut these bevels on the table saw? Well, it's because, once again, I was scared. This is a 24.5 degree angle and totally within the range of making a safe bevel cut. But I just knew I'd screw it up and regret it. So I took the patient route. I literally sharpened my plane about every 10 minutes while working on this one edge. It took all of an hour or more just to make this cut. My shoulders and hands ached the whole next week from this operation. I've never been more aware of how out of shape I am. Then I stared at the end grain for a while, dreading and knowing for sure that I'd blow out the end grain or hurt myself trying to cut that much away with just a number five. I remembered how Sean Boyd handled a similar situation in one of his videos and tried making this jig he was kind enough to send me the 3D model for but I couldn't get it to work for me, so I went to plan B, which is to step cut the bulk of the material away with the router and then come back and remove what was left with the hand plane. I worked from both sides to avoid the grain blowout I feared, and that worked pretty well. It still took ages, even with the router, but I didn't lose any lives.
the upper cabinet was definitely more familiar territory for me. I've made similar plywood cases in the past. The only tricky bit was keeping all the different parts properly oriented to each other. You'd be surprised how confusing wrangling two sides, a top, and two shelves can be when they're all nearly the same size. I used 5mm dominoes to hold it together. Since I had done all my milling work at the beginning of the project, getting the face frame together was actually a cinch. No frills joinery here. Pocket holes do a great job, and the hardest part was just sneaking up on a tight fit when cutting the rails to length. Okay, what you're about to see as I apply finish to this piece is really polished over and honestly a little misleading. This was the most difficult and frustrating part of this whole process. I made so many mistakes. I was sanding things back. I had issues matching. I had issues with blotching. And honestly, I got so frustrated at one point that I just stopped filming. Uh, I almost gave up making this video because I was like, how am I going to coherently explain everything that went wrong in this process? And that's my bad. That's on me. Recording your mistakes is just something that we do on YouTube. It's we're here to have a community to communicate what we're learning. And I just didn't do that. And so that's my bad. So just know it didn't go that smoothly. And just for not recording my mistakes, I lose a life. The plan for this finish takes a few steps. First, apply seal coat, which is basically de-wax shellac. This is meant to help the stain go evenly and reduce or eliminate blotching. Second, apply a dye stain directly after giving the shellac a light sanding. Next, go over everything with a couple of coats of custom blended pigment stain, and finally, buff on a couple of coats of Osmo Pollux. This was a bad plan. Now. Matching the color to the rest of my mom's bedroom furniture was part of the project brief, so I had to stain it somehow. The shellac step was necessary because it turns out hard maple is extremely prone to blotching. I had to sand back and refinish several components because it's really easy to sand through the shellac you just added, even with 400 grit sandpaper, which allows the stain to flood the grain and blotch anyway. Also, oil-based pigment stain over dye is just a bad idea in general and combined with the blotching just led to a lot of streaking that I had to deal with. What I should have done is figured out one dye stain to use, applied it right after the shellac, and called it good. Even better would have been to make a dye that matched and then just mix it in directly with my shellac and sprayed it on after glue up. Shellac is amazing stuff from what I've read, but it takes practice to use. This isn't my last piece using it, but anyone could tell you looking at it, it's definitely my first. All that to say, Finishing was hard. What I love about making things is that no matter what mistakes you make, there is almost always some way to fix it, learn from it, and move on. It might be expensive, like letting pricey material go to waste. It might be time consuming, 
like spending the one evening this week you have in the shop remaking a panel starting with rough lumber instead of making progress on the next thing. But the reality is that you can't buy the memory and education you earn, and I mean earn, from screwing up. This may be obvious at this point, but I've never made anything like this before in my woodworking career. This is the first piece I've ever made almost entirely of solid hardwood involving several panel glue ups, dozens of dominoes, angles, curves, and sliding doors. I jumped into the deep end of the pool here. I'm playing the game for the very first time on hard mode. If I didn't, I'd still be making things I feel safe making. But I don't want to just feel safe. I want to be making fine, unique hardwood furniture. And the way I see it, if you aren't doing what you want to be doing, you'll never get good at it. So I think that's really my message. Get out in the shop and push yourself. Don't let the fear of failure keep you from doing what you want to do. Dream it up and just give it a shot, even if you have to do it on hard mode.